Hey guys, it's me your tech bud and in this video, we'll cover the basics of event driven architecture. This video is going to be building on top of my previous video on microservice communications. So do check that out if you haven't already. Okay, event driven architectures are nothing but a set of asynchronous communication patterns used to decouple microservices. Decoupling allows you to build, test, and deploy your microservices independently of each other, which in turn greatly increases developer productivity. Before we dive into event-driven architectures, it's important to understand the difference between synchronous and asynchronous communication. Starting with synchronous communication, it is a request response pattern where we expect to receive an absolute response. Now I know what you're thinking. Isn't this like every other form of communication? I mean, everyone returns some kind of response, right? The differentiation factor here is what the response means. Let's take an example to understand this. When inserting a record in a database, the database sends back a response in the form of an acknowledgement. But what does that acknowledgement mean? It's intuitive to think that a positive response means that the insert went through successfully and that your data has been persisted to disk. This sounds logical and everything would become a lot more reliable if it worked this way. This is a classic example of synchronous communication. Even if you introduce a proxy or a load balancer in front of your database, the response would still mean the same thing. Now, what if I told you that the act meant the database has accepted your insert command and will perform the actual write to disk later. In this scenario, you don't really know if the database operation will go through or not because it hasn't really been performed yet. Imagine working in such an environment. It's complete chaos. That's asynchronous communication for you. You still get back a response but here, the actual operation is queued or differed. The caller doesn't really have to wait for the task to be done. Asynchronous communication sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But what has all of this got to do with event-driven architectures anyways? It's intuitive for us to think in terms of synchronous communication, where each response means that the task has either completed or failed. It's easier to design your systems this way. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you carefully. Synchronous microservices are slowing you down. You heard me right. The fact is, synchronous communication tightly couples your microservices together. And tightly coupled microservices are nothing but distributed monoliths which are way harder to build, debug, and maintain. Take the example of a user sign up operation which is followed by sending out a welcome email. Let's assume both of these operations are happening in separate microservices. Now, for things to work, the user service after successfully completing sign up will have to send a request to the email service to send out a welcome email. I've got a couple of problems here. In a synchronous world, the user service would have to wait on the email service to finish its operation before it can send back a response to the client. What if the email service is slow? What if the SMTP server is down? Who is responsible to retry in case of failures? We are hurting the end user's experience by making the sign-up process slow for no fault of the user service. My second problem is, what if I want to do something else whenever a user signs up, like update a dashboard? We'll have to modify and redeploy our user service to achieve something like this. This just doesn't sound right. Why is the user service even aware of the existence of the email or dashboard service in the first place? And this is just a single example. There could be several such scenarios all over your application. Apparently, the only way out is asynchronous microservices. Ideally, a user's microservice shouldn't have to worry about other ancillary operations. We need to find a way to automatically trigger those operations in the background whenever a user signs up. The easiest way to achieve this is by using a pop-sub messaging system like RabbitMQ. Here, instead of talking to other services directly, 
the user's microservice will publish a new user event in RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ will immediately send back a response acknowledging the receipt of the event. Remember, the event hasn't really been processed yet. On getting this acknowledgement, the user service sends back a response to the end user. RabbitMQ on the other hand will forward the event to whoever is subscribed or interested in it. In this case, our subscribers are the email and dashboard microservices. RabbitMQ will also take the responsibility of retrying in case of failures. This is called the fan out pattern and it is also what decouples our microservices and makes them work independently of each other. Now I know what you're thinking. I've taken an easy example on purpose. What if my user services behavior depends on whether the event has processed or not? Well, point noted. Let's extend our example to accommodate this. Let's say after the user signs up, we want to send a verification email and add the user only when the verification is successful. To make things more interesting, we want to make sure the user is removed if any internal error occurs anywhere in this flow. So this is fairly complicated, but we can solve this simply by chaining events together. The flow starts with the user service receiving a sign up request. It will then proceed to make a temporary user record in the database and then publish a temporary user event in RabbitMQ. On receiving this event, the email service will perform the email verification process and publish a verification complete event once it's done. On receiving this event, the user service marks the user as verified in its database. If there was an error anywhere in this flow, we can publish a remove user event. The user service can simply delete the user's record on receiving that. This is what we call a two-phase commit process. The first write is a temporary one indicating an intent. The second update is marking the intent as committed. This pattern is a great way to handle distributed transactions. There are a lot more event-driven patterns out there. I've covered two of the most important ones today. Let me know in the comment section if you want a dedicated video on event-driven communication patterns. Now, there are two things to keep in mind when going event-driven. First, all your operations need to be idempotent. That's a fancy way of saying that your system should work even if the same event was delivered multiple times. What I mean is, your user service shouldn't crash if it receives the verification complete event for the same user twice. The second thing to remember is that each service should manage its own state. Notice my email service pushed a verification complete event instead of updating the user's table directly. There is a reason for that. Sharing state between microservices is inviting architectural nightmares. Keeping a track of all the state dependencies is not easy once you have more than 10 microservices. This is probably why the idea to dedicate one database for each microservice got so popular. Before we wrap up, I have one more pro tip for you guys, which will help you take event-driven architectures to a whole new level. Whatever we have discussed today relied heavily on the services publishing events to keep the chain going. This is a potential point of failure. What if a microservice fails right before it can publish an event? It would have to redo all the work again unnecessarily. Or even worse, our entire event chain could end up in a broken state. If you have been observant, you will find that some of the operations we spoke about earlier have one thing in common. They are considered complete once the write to the database is successful. Now, if you think about it, we won't have to publish events if our database could publish them on our behalf. Luckily, we can use CDC tools like Debezium to achieve exactly this. CDC involves triggering events based on database mutations by monitoring database logs. It's an extremely reliable source of events since you can simply replay the logs in case of failures. Serverless has championed this architectural pattern. For example, when you're on AWS, you can trigger Lambda functions for operations done in DynamoDB and S3. 
I'll put a link to a relevant white paper in the description below. That's it for this video. I'm planning to make a more hands-on guide on this, so it's probably a good time to subscribe. Like and share if you found this video to be helpful. And don't forget, I am your tech bird here on YouTube and hopefully in real life.